ಸರ್ವೂತು ವಿಷ್ಣು ಮಾತಿ ನಮಸ್ತ 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 ನಮೋ ನಮ ಯಾೂತು ದಯಾರುಪೇನ ಸಂಸ್ಥಿ ನಮಸ್ತ 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 ನಮೋ ನಮ ಯಾೂತು ಶಕ್ತಿ ಸಂಸ್ಥಿ ನಮಸ್ತ 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 ನಮೋ ನಮ ಜಗನ ಮಾಹೆ ಜಗ ಜನನಿ ಜಗನ ಮಾಹೆ ಜಗ ಜನನಿ ಜಯ ಜಗದಂಬೆ ದೇವಿ ಭವಾನಿ ಜಯ ಜಗದಂಬೆ ದೇವಿ ಭವಾನಿ ದೇವಿ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ದುರ್ಗಾಲಕ್ಷಿ ದೇವಿ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ದುರ್ಗಾಲಕ್ಷಿ ಮಹಿಷಾಸುರ ಸಂಹಾರಿಣಿ ಮಾತ ಮಹಿಷಾಸುರ ಸಂಹಾರಿಣಿ ಮಾತ ಜಗನ ಮಾಹೆ ಜಗ ಜನನಿ ಜಗ ಜನ Namaste, everyone. I want to first thank Anjali Swami, Swami Ji for that beautiful shloka. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Adele Nazarian, and I will be hosting today's gala event. I just wanted to briefly introduce Anjali Swami Ji to our audience. She has a passion for music and has had one since childhood and hails from a musically inclined family. She has experience performing in all India radio, Birmingham Conservatoire, and BBC West Midlands. She currently resides in Arizona with her family and performs throughout the United States. In her full-time capacity, outside of being a wife and a mother, she works as a product manager in the Department of Economic Security for Arizona State. We will be hearing from Anjali Ji again throughout our program. And now we go to our program. So many of us here today are so fortunate to experience living in a diverse society like the United States of America a place where identity politics has become an increasingly prominent fixture in grassroots activism throughout the nation. While it is important to celebrate diversity, it is unfortunate when race, color, creed, and faith are used to divide society. This is our challenge. To paraphrase the late Martin Luther King Jr., we are at a place where the dream that we may someday live in a nation where our ch children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character is still not fully realized. Today, we are gathered with a richly diverse group of wonderful human beings who are committed to, and through their hard work and practical application, are doing their part to contribute to a nation and world where we may finally fulfill this late visionary's dream, a dream so many of us share. 
Today's gala titled Value-Based Politics, The Hindu Way, will discuss what it means to transcend the fault lines of color and to evolve politics based on the ethos of humanity, human values, diversity, and true equality. We're so pleased to have everyone with us today. Now, I am very excited to introduce Dr. Ajay Shah to our program. Dr. Ajay Shah serves as the president of the World Hindu Council of America, VHPA. He's also the founder and convener of the American Hindus Against Defamation, AHAD, and Hindu Pact, and has played a pioneering role in presenting Hindu Dharma on the internet. In fact, he was featured in the book, The Soul of Cyberspace, How New Technology is Changing Our Spiritual Lives by Jeffrey Zaleski. Dr. Shaw, we are honored to have you with us and the floor is now yours. Thank you, Adele. Namaste, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So you may ask, why are we talking, why are you talking about value-based politics the Hindu way? Aren't you just promoting uh, identity politics? Do you really want US politics to be narrow, shallow, and siloed? How can faith be underlying principle for democracy where we have professed uh, you know, and constitutionalized uh, the separation between church and state, right? But there is a little bit more to it. American Declaration of Independence, Independence calls for life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Now take a look at the American Hindu idols and see how they match with the American idols. The Hindu idols are ekam sata vipraho bahuda vadanti. The truth is one, but the sages see it in different ways or call it by different names. Hindu dharma calls for true freedom, not just political freedom, not just freedom to pursue your passion, and not just freedom of religion, but a true spiritual freedom, freedom to believe in God or not, worship God in any form, follow any religious book, follow any deity, and a lot more. Maha Upanishad says, Ayam bandhureya neti ganana lagu chetasam udara charita natu vasudheva kutumbakam. To believe or to say that this one is a relative or a friend and a brother and everyone else is an outsider is for the narrow-minded or mean-minded, for those who are known as magnanimous, for those people who are magnanimous. The entire world, the entire universe, is one family. Hindu dharma guides us to believe in true equality. It commands us to treat our fellow human beings as part of one universal family, regardless of our outward differences of race, ethnicity, nationality, gender, uh, or social class. These are the ideals, the Hindu ideals, that are consistent with the American Declaration of Independence. And these are the ideals we want to promote in America. And that is why the theme of today's gala. It is no wonder then when then the rule by people or rule by the people finds mention in the most sacred Hindu book, Rigveda, where we find sabha or an assembly, samiti or a committee where matters of the state were discussed and vidhata, a form of assembly where men and women collectively participated to perform economic, military, religious, and social functions. The Hindu political system was Ganatantra, a system closer to republic than a monarchy. Even large republics like Ganapada or Mahaganapadas existed thousands of years ago and find mention in the ancient history or Itihasa called Mahabharat. When Alexander invaded India, his historians noted free and independent communities which were functioning like democracies. The inscription on the walls of a temple in Uttara Merur in Tamil Nadu from the Chola dynasty in 920 AD describes the electoral democracy practiced in that era. The Hindu monarchs were not absolute rulers. They were commanded to follow the laws and not to make them. Even Bhagwan Sri Ram endured personal sacrifice for Raj Dharma or the Dharma of public life. And Hindu King Sibi sacrificed his own flesh. That is the, that is the Hindu value-based politics. 
This is what Hindu Pact promotes. And that is why today we seek your support to spread these noble Hindu ideals of democracy in America. Bhagwan Shri Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, whatever action the leader performs, common men follow. And whatever standards the leader sets by exemplary acts, all world pursue. Today's world desperately needs leaders who can promote these ideals of leadership. Hindu Pact seeks to hire future leaders who will follow the leadership path that is laid out by Sri Krishna. And that is why we seek funds to support Hindu Pact today. Bhagavad Gita teaches us to be fearless in protection of truth and dharma. Inspired by Guru Tegh Bahadur, Hindu Pact believes in fearless advocacy. We have taken stand where others have not. We advocate for Hindu girls in Pakistan and obtained original video footages from Pakistan. We were among the very few who spoke unequivocally against the Islamophobia bill. We stood up to the onslaught against Indian laws to grant preferential immigration to persecuted Hindu minority in Indian subcontinent. We demanded that Hindu genocide in Bangladesh and Kashmir be recognized. We stood up for the sacred swastika and demanded that it not be conflated with Hitler's Hakenkraus. We called out the Canadian Prime Minister for his hypocrisy. We did not shy away from asking the Biden campaign for website on Hindu issues when he had won for all other faiths. We called USCIRF what it is, Hindu-phobic and India-phobic. We exposed the nexus between the, uh, behind the assault on the essence of Hindu dharma or the tatwa of Hindu dharma, Hindutva. We will not let them dismantle Hindu dharma by dismantling the essence of Hindu dharma. But we need to do more. We need to do a lot more. There are Hindu-hating advocacy groups that have a staff of dozens. We are up against them. There are well-funded think tanks and academicians who, whose life work is to destroy the plurality and diversity that Hindu dharma offers. They are working overtime to build anti-Hindu narrative and deprive Hindu youth of their heritage. They say Vedas were appropriated by the Hindus. We must counter this and we will counter this. Our goal today is modest. We are seeking to fund, we are seeking funds to get, just get $350,000 so that we can have a few full-time employees to formalize our advocacy, support leadership development, establish formal policy research function, and continue our investigation into the Hindu hating nexus right here in America. We are counting on your support today. Thank you and namaste. Thank you so much. Ajay Shaji for that very powerful, powerful speech. And we must, as you so astutely stated, look at history so that we can see where the wisdom of the past is and to ensure that the same mistakes that were made in the past are not repeated in the future. Um, I like to quote James Bond here and say, sometimes the old ways are the best ways. So tradition has a lot of, of important role to play. So once again, thank you um, for also highlighting everything that has been done so far. Speaking of highlighting things that have been accomplished, I would like to now turn our attention to a video that highlights the truly incredible work and accomplishments of Hindu Pact over the past year. Take a look. Hindu Policy Research and Advocacy Collective USA, Hindu Pact USA, is an initiative of the World Hindu Council of America, VHPA, the oldest and one of the most prominent Hindu organizations in America. I am Utsav Chakrabarti, the Executive Director for Hindu Pact, Hindu Policy Research and Advocacy Collective. We are here to secure the future for the next generation of American Hindus. And I am Adana Zarian, Director of Legislative Outreach and Communications for Hindu Pact, and we are strong advocates for religious freedom and the U.S. Constitution and the principles that were enshrined in the vision of our founding fathers. We thank you for your continued support. The work we do never ends. 
Over the past year alone, we've covered a multitude of issues that affect the lives of everyday Americans, as well as Hindus living in countries around the world. 2021 was the first full year of our work. Here is a glimpse of some of the things we accomplished. The Coalition for Hindu Girls Abducted and Their Rights, or Chingari, has focused on bringing visibility to the situation of young Hindu girls in Pakistan, who are often kidnapped, forcibly converted, and trafficked. The only organization to actively shed light on this devastating issue, Hindu Pact, has obtained exclusive footage from these atrocities from inside Pakistan. Last year, our team met with over 25 lawmakers on Capitol Hill and many more at the state level to discuss this issue. We also interfaced with the State Department. We organized three protests at the Embassy of Pakistan in Washington, D.C., and held rallies in more than 10 cities across the country to sensitize young Americans about the plight of religious minorities in Pakistan. Our demand that Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and political leader Jagmeet Singh apologize to the Hindu and Sikh communities for comparing the Nazi hacking crews with the Hindu religious symbol of divinity, peace, prosperity and good fortune, the swastika, drew global attention. There has been an increase in hate crimes targeting Hindus in Canada in the recent past. Hindu groups in Canada say they're being subjected to hate because the Prime Minister cannot get his symbols right. Here's what a swastik looks like, what they call the swastika. It's a symbol of divinity and spirituality, not just in Hinduism, but also in Buddhism and Jainism. What Trudeau and Singh were talking about, the Harkin Kreutz, the identity of the Nazi party of Adolf Hitler. But Hindu groups in Canada say Trudeau's misrepresentation has put their community in danger. One of them is the Hindu Pact, Hindu Policy Research and Advocacy Co Collective. Let me share with you what they've told Justin Trudeau. We believe this misrepresentation will lead to hate crimes against Hindus and Sikhs. In the past month alone, six Hindu temples were vandalized and looted in Canada. Hindu temples have been on target in Trudeau's Canada. The first incident in fact happened in November last year. Two temples were targeted in Brampton. The Hindu Sabha Temple and Sri Jagannath Temple. And in recent months, a number of temples have been vandalized. In at least six temples, cash from donation boxes and ornaments from Hindu gods have been stolen. This is part of our effort to counter organized Hinduphobia or Hindu Devesha in America. We successfully requested that universities across the U.S. take immediate action to prevent the vilification and intimidation of students and faculty of Hindu heritage and those of Indian origin by a well-organized anti-Hindu coalition. They organized a nationwide campaign titled Dismantling Hindutva, which targeted Hindus of diverse backgrounds and India by branding them as fascists. Hindu PAC members and alumni of Wayne State University worked to expose pathological Hindu hater and law professor Khalid Beydoun. The university was forced to issue a letter of apology in response to Professor Beydoun's vitriol and hate against Hindus. A significant portion of anti-Hindu hatred on our campuses and in the public square emerges from groups and organizations that use Islamist narratives against India on Kashmir as propaganda points. To counter this propaganda, Hindu Pact took a proactive approach. We were involved in educating more than 20 lawmakers on these efforts by Pakistan, Turkey and Qatar to run influence operations using the help of American Muslim organizations that may compromise the integrity of our republic. Some of these influence efforts are directed at Democratic Party lawmakers and community activists. Our Kashmir team, led by Sanjay Kal, proactively countered a massive anti-India event in Sarajevo, organized by Pakistani agencies in partnership with Al Jazeera and Turkey-based groups. Hindu Pact organized an educational event on Capitol Hill with Global Kashmiri Pandit Diaspora, GKPD. 
our graphic wall at the Washington Monument was very well received. Our team has been working diligently to recognize the atrocities committed by the Pakistani army in 1971 in Bangladesh as a genocide. During this time, both the Genocide Watch and the Lemkin Institute have come up with reports requesting U.S. and multilateral authorities to declare the Pakistani army a perpetrator of genocide of three million people. So far, we have met with over 20 members of Congress and have mobilized grassroots support for this through readouts in city councils across the country. The Armenian American Community and Armenian National Committee of America, ANCA, have partnered in some cities to promote this effort. The Irvine mayor has joked about making Armenians disappear. Denying the Armenian genocide would have been bad enough, but to joke about it, that too, with the people that support the perpetrators of genocide, is far, far worse. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. As a Hindu, who people have faced multiple genocides, including the Bengali genocide, we demand that all genocide be recognized and that the perpetrators be held to account. In October, Hindu Pak was a key driver of the Hindu Heritage Month Diwali truck. More than 35 states and cities gave proclamations. And on Deepawali Eve, we wish the people of Manhattan with a digital truck. After the House passed Representative Ilhan Omar's bill on Islamophobia, Hindu Pact launched a campaign to expose the deceptive and discriminatory nature of the bill. The bill, which is currently lying dormant in the Senate, can be used to target and victimize individuals and organizations that oppose radical groups in Islamic theocracies. Hindu Pact was able to educate senators on this issue. On many occasions, we were told that they were not aware of the ramifications that this bill would have. As we approach the midterm elections, Hindu Pact is engaging more and more leaders across the country to share our views on issues that concern Hindu communities across the globe. Ekam Sat Vipraha Bahuda Vadanti. Truth is one, sages call it by different names. Make sure to follow us on Twitter and other social media at Hindu Pact. That's H I N D U P A C T. Thank you for your continued support. We cannot do this without you. Namaste. Namaste. Well, that was a really powerful, beautiful video. And uh, I am now really honored to introduce our keynote speaker, Vivek Ramaswamy. Vivek Ramaswamy is a New York Times bestselling author and a successful entrepreneur who has founded multiple successful enterprises. He's a first generation American and the founder and executive chairman of Royvant Scientists. Sciences, rather, a new type of biopharmaceutical company focused on the application of technology to drug development. He has, in addition to this, authored numerous articles and op-eds which have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, National Review, Newsweek, and the Harvard Business Review. Introducing the, Mr. Ramaswamy will be our own Renu Sharma Guptaji, who is the director, project manager, and chapter coordinator for Hindu Pact. She is from Cincinnati, Ohio, and has known Vivek for a very long time. Vivek Ji and Renu Ji, the floor is yours. Namaskar, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce Vivek. I have known Ramaswamy family since Vivek was in high school. 
Today, my heart is filled with joy and pride to see our Cincinnati boy has become a national international fame. Not only that, he is a true role model for young Hindus in America. So Vivek, welcome to Hindu Pact Gala. Thank you, Renuanti. It's great to be introduced by you many years later after we used to gather in your, in your house to learn about our, uh, our religion. Uh, look, I, I'm, I'm honored to be here today and I'm gonna offer some remarks that relate to you know, themes of American civic responsibility actually, but that echo some of the very themes of Hindu identity that we just heard about. And it's, it's a real honor to join you and I hope it's a, it's a conversation starter for the rest of the event. I will tell you that the idea of thinking about America's own roots and seeing it through a Hindu lens is not as far-fetched as you might think, actually, even through a study of American history. John Adams, America's second president, one of the founding fathers who signed the Declaration of Independence, actually after he was the second president of the United States, went on to become a scholar of Hindu texts, went on to become a student of Sanskrit, and in his famous letters to Thomas Jefferson, his one-time friend turned political rival turned friend again in their retirement, in his letters to John Adams. He frequently wrote that if he had to live life again, he would do it first as a Sanskrit scholar in the first time around. And these guys wrote each other the letters, not just casually, but knowing that they would be read by posterity. And so I think that there's real echoes to what we heard from, from Ajay and others, even in the introductory section, about looking at the modern American challenges through an even Hindu informed prism. And that's what I'll aim to do in my comments, which will focus on an unusual question that I, I'll admit I had not reflected on before I was asked to speak at this event. But after I was asked to speak at this event, I was thinking about suitable comments. And you know, one that came to mind for me was reflecting on what someone like Shankaracharya might say if he were walking the modern American plains today. And I'll get to that in a second. But before I do, I'll actually start not with a story from Hindu scriptures or a story about Shankaracharya, but actually a story about Christ. It's my favorite story about Christ. It doesn't come from the Bible. It actually comes from a parable from Fyodor Dostoevsky's famous book, The Brothers Karamazov. I first read it at St. Xavier High School, where Reno Auntie's son and I actually went to school together. Uh, despite being Hindus, we were amongst the few Hindu kids at uh, Catholic High School in St. X. This is where I was first exposed to this story about Christ. But I'll tell it for a moment because I think it has something to do with the rest of my remarks. It's a story that Dostoevsky tells where Christ comes back to earth in the middle of the Spanish Inquisition. At the height of the Inquisition, he shows up on the streets of Seville, Spain. And the head of the church in Spain, the Grand Inquisitor, spots him on the street. And then he has Christ arrested. And the peak of the chapter is actually the dialogue between the Grand Inquisitor and Christ in the prison cell. And what the Grand Inquisitor tells Christ is that we, the church, don't need you here anymore. In fact, your presence here is impeding our work. And he sentences Christ to execution the next morning. I frequently tell this story when I'm speaking to audiences across the country today discussing the American cultural challenges we face today, because just as I think the church in that story in the height of the Spanish Inquisition in Spain sentenced to death the true God who they were supposed to safeguard, I see the same thing happening on modern American soil today, where this new church of what I call capital D diversity has actually sentenced to death the true American ideal of true diversity, true diversity of viewpoints, true diversity of identities, the true diversity of identities within each of us at the altar in the name of this new postmodern church of diversity that rejects that vision that Martin Luther King had 60 years ago, which Adele spoke about in those opening remarks. I, I can tell you, I personally remember the time that I first heard Martin Luther King's famous speech back when I was in second grade in Cincinnati, Ohio where he said, I hope my four children grow up in a country where they're judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. And I'll tell you that dream, it stuck with me. It meant something to me because it was actually the dream that allowed 
my parents, like so many of you on this call, to come to this country 40 years ago and build successful careers for themselves, despite the fact that they had thick Indian accents and came to this country with almost no money. It was the dream that allowed me to go in a single generation from being their kid to becoming the founder of multi-billion dollar enterprises that I had a privilege of leading, in one case as CEO for seven years. In that case, I ended up leading a company that developed medicines. And the one that I was most proud of was a medicine that I had the privilege of working on to treat prostate cancer. But I've turned my attention over the last couple of years to working on this different kind of cancer, not a biological cancer, but this cultural cancer that threatens to kill that dream that Martin Luther King had 60 years ago, a cancer that threatened to kill the dream that allowed me and many of you on this call to achieve what we have in the course of our lives as Americans. And that new cancer takes the form of this new secular religion in our country that says that your identity is based on your race, your gender, and your sexual orientation, full stop. It says that America was a systemically racist country, that if you're black, you're inherently disadvantaged, that if you're white, or increasingly, if you're Indian American, you're inherently privileged, regardless of your economic background or your upbringing. Your race and your gender govern who you are and the thoughts and ideas you're allowed to have, according to this secular religion. You can hear it in the words of its high priests. One of my favorite high priests of this new religion is Ibram Kendi, the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, who famously said that the only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination, end quote. Or through Ayanna Presley, a famous member of the so-called squad in Congress, who famously said a couple of years ago that we don't want any more black or brown faces that don't want to be a black or brown voice, end quote. There's a really clever premise embedded in that religion, and it's this. It's that when your race goes from being about your skin color to being about your voice, about the content of the ideas that you're allowed to have, about the content of your viewpoints, then any disagreement with that viewpoint may automatically be labeled racist. And, and there is no greater damnation in modern America than to be called a racist. So when given the choice between pledging allegiance to that new secular religion and being tarred with this scarlet R, what we're seeing is that everyday Americans are choosing to bend the knee. And that's what's created this new culture of fear that I see in our country. Fear of losing your jobs, fear of your kids suffering in school, fear of becoming a pariah or being called a name in your community. And that's the culture of fear that I worry is, is increasingly eroding our culture of free speech in America. The culture of free speech that said that you didn't have to fear for speaking your mind, for fear, for fear of putting food on the dinner table, that you're supposed to get to enjoy both of those things at once. And to bring me back to that story of Christ, just as that grand inquisitor sentenced the true Christ at the altar, I worry that this new church of diversity has actually sacrificed true diversity at the altar that this new church of inclusion has actually created this new culture of exclusion where certain points of view just aren't welcome. And that this new culture of capital D democracy is actually sacrificing our true democratic ideals of free speech and open debate and true equality in the civic sphere. So, so th that, those are the kinds of issues I end up talking about in some of the works I've written and some of the books that I've written, including the book that I most recently published but I'd actually like to shift the conversation over to think about that as an example of one of the cultural challenges that we face. What might, as I mused at the beginning, what might Shankaracharya say if he were walking the modern American plane facing the cultural challenges that we face today? If he saw those challenges in modern day America, taking the figure who we knew walked the plains of ancient India in the eighth century, what might he say today? I think about that as I was, I thought about that as I was preparing for these remarks. And what I learned about him is that in his day, he saw that the priestly class of his contemporary group had adopted this culture of ritualism over a culture of true faith. And through their ritualism, they had inadvertently created this false dualism, this philosophy of separating human beings from God, a philosophy that separated and divided our humanity from divineness, from God over the oneness, the true oneness between human beings and God. 
And we'll all recall that actually Buddha saw the same problem. He saw the same rift, saw the same failures of the priestly class, but he went a different direction. He went the direction of going a different way, splintering off and founding a sister religion to Hinduism. Shankaracharya went a different direction. He went the direction of trying to reform Hinduism from within. And, and when I look at modern America, I actually think that in some ways we face that same choice today. When I see all the things that are badly wrong with the country, there may be the choice of splintering off and going in a different direction, but I prefer the path of reforming the country and the culture that we have from within rather than to see it splinter in two or to go in two different directions. And so in that sense, I guess if we had to pick, I might pick Shankaracharya as our muse, as our example that we might reflect on, the right example that we might draw from. So what might he say if he were walking those modern American plains today, just as he walked the Indian subcontinent 1200 years ago? I think he'd say four things. And that's what I'll close my remarks with. I think the first thing that he would say is that just as he told his contemporaries in ancient India to stop listening to that priestly class, I think he would tell our everyday citizens in this country to stop listening to the managerial class that today runs our government, that runs our private sector, that runs increasingly even our universities and our military and our educational system. I think he would say that the defining struggle of our time isn't actually the conflicts, the artificial conflicts between those citizens, between left and right, between black and white. It would instead be between this increasingly powerful managerial class in our country, the same people who populate the three letter bureaucratic agencies in government that then populate the boards of directors and private sector entities that take their instructions from the big government that then in turn populate the associate deanships at universities that increasingly bureaucratize higher education in America, who then go on to become ambassadors abroad, who then go on to become appointed to become mid-level bureaucrats back in government again, to take that managerial class and to divide them from the everyday citizen. What he would say is that's a false division and the everyday citizen needs to recognize their own agency against that increasingly powerful managerial class. He would say that the people who run our institutions need to do a better job of safeguarding the true purpose of those institutions rather than just using those institutions to further codify their own power. I think that's the first thing he might tell us, that that's the defining struggle of our time, not the one between left and right or black and white, but between that managerial class and the everyday citizen. The second thing he might say is that just as he told his contemporaries in ancient India to cut out those religious rituals, or at least the ritualism that fetishized those rituals. He would tell us to get rid of our secular rituals too. The words that you can't say for fear of castigation, the clothes you can't wear for fear of allegations of cultural appropriation, the apologies that you must recite in public to avoid cancellation, the letters of the alphabet that you must capitalize, like the B in black, lest you be labeled a bad name. The letters you must not capitalize, like the W in white, lest you be labeled that same bad name. He would tell us to start talking openly again, even if that meant taking the risk of occasionally saying the wrong thing, rather than practicing ritualism in our speech, where out of the fear of saying the wrong thing, we end up saying nothing at all, and actually saying not only nothing at all, but talking to each other less along the way. That's the second thing that I think he might tell us. The third thing, as I reflected on it, was a reflection of the hardships that he himself encountered in his short life of 32 years. As he walked by foot across the entire Indian subcontinent, he encountered a lot of hardships as he took that journey. I think he would remind us today that we'll encounter hardship in our lives as Americans too. Human beings always have. He did in his era, Christ did in his era, human beings have as long as human beings have walked this earth. But that hardship is not the same thing as victimhood. That hardship is what teaches us who we are. At its best, hardship might even be what brings us closer to God. And that the hardship that America encounters today, and dare I say, I expect the hardships that America will continue to encounter in the couple of years ahead, which I fear will get worse before they become better, those hardships may actually be what leads our country to actually becoming and rediscovering the truest version of itself, not as a victim, 
but as a victor over those hardships in the end. And I think fourth and finally, the final thing that he might leave with us as a lesson to reflect on is that just as he shed his own bodily identity at the young age of 32, in achieving Mahasamadhi, he would encourage us Americans, we Americans, to perhaps do the same thing, to shed the false identities that we wear today, not necessarily just our bodily identities, but the social identities that we adopt, the social identities of victimhood, of race, of gender, of class, of sexual orientation, the skin deep attributes that we have been taught to fetishize today in the name of diversity, to say that we may want to shed those identities today and instead rediscover the few things that actually bind us together across those diverse attributes. To say that in the year 2022, we may have come off of a year, really a decade, of celebrating our diversity, our differences, the differences in the way we look, the differences in the characteristics we inherit on the day we're born, on the back of what I might call our diversity decade, and to say that there may have been some good that came from that, but so be it. Let the next decade be about reviving those few things that still bind us together as one people across that diversity, the ability to freely speak our minds without fear of political retaliation. And perhaps above all, the dream that I mentioned at the very beginning, the dream that Adele mentioned at the very beginning, that dream that Martin Luther King had 60 years ago, the idea that no matter who you are or where you came from or what your skin color is, that you can achieve anything you ever want with your own hard work, your own commitment and your own dedication, the rich identity within your skin color, whether it is white, brown, black, or something in between. That is the American dream. In many ways, that is a Hindu dream. I think it's a dream that we all share. It's a dream that we care to revive. And it's a dream that I think we as Hindu Americans can play a special role in reviving by drawing on our traditions and drawing on our beliefs to bring that lesson back on modern American soil. So with that, I wanna thank all of you for inviting me graciously this Sunday to, to join Hindu Pact, to Renu Auntie in particular, who it was, it was a true joy to be uh, reconnected with or to hear from again after, after so many years. And hopefully on a future occasion, we'll even see all of you in person. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, well, that was wonderful. I mean, Vivek, we're looking forward to having you back again and continue this conversation. Thank you for all of your insights and so beautifully tying everything together, um, past, present, future, and uh, truly it has given inspiration for the path ahead and really achieving our collective goals here. So thank you again. Thank you. Now, I'd like to also say if anyone has any questions, please enter them into the chat box to your right. We'd love to hear from you. And we, of course, thank you for your contributions to Hindu Pact. Now, I am pleased to introduce, to introduce Robert Lancia. Bob Lancia is a former congressman who served two terms in the Rhode Island House of Representatives from his own district, 16, in his hometown of Cranston, Rhode Island. Rhode Island is a beautiful state for anyone who hasn't visited, I highly recommend it. He is a former Navy chaplain and a disabled veteran. Thank you for your service. It's an honor to have you with us today, Congressman Lancia, the floor is yours. Hi, good, good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this event today. I'm very excited. Um, I just want to correct one thing. I am a, a congressional candidate, uh, former state representative, and we are we ran in 2020, came close, so close to winning. We've immediately announced again, and we're running again here in 2022. So we am a candidate, but we did serve two terms in the Rhode Island House of Representatives. So thank you for that. Um, yes, I am a disabled vet. Uh, I'm also an ordained American Baptist minister here in uh, the United States. Um, you know, uh, listening to everyone, I'm just great uh, discussion today. A um, couple of things I would like to say, and you know, my wife and I, my wife Mary and I have been very, very involved with the Hindu community, the India community, 
going back to 2015 when I was first elected to the Rhode House of Representatives. And we've gotten more and more involved. In fact, uh, we, we consider ourselves to be actually part of the India family. It's, it's uh, just fascinating uh, how much we've learned and how much we've got to know everybody. And it's been exciting. Um, two concepts that, uh, and I may pronounce these wrong, I'm gonna try to pronounce them correctly. And I heard them kind of spoken about earlier. Uh, the first one is uh, Batsud Haiba, uh, Katum Bakam, which, if I'm understanding correctly, means the whole world is one family. Um, and the second one, uh, of course, is the fact, the other concept that was talked about and taught is that the second concept is truth, the need for truth, that there are many ways to get there. And that's another core value of Hinduism, uh, the truth, and that the world, whole world is one family. And, uh, you know, that's something that I think is so important. And a lot of people today have spoken about John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and Martin Luther King. I'd like to go a little further back to my own state of Rhode Island. We have a pioneer in this state, Roger Williams. Roger Williams founded the state of Rhode Island. And in fact, a lot of the American values and ideals were actually from people that looked at what Roger Williams did, our Declaration of Independence, our separation of church and state. Roger Williams in Rhode Island played a key role in all of that. And so I would encourage people to perhaps study Roger Williams because he really, and the state was the basis for much of, again, our constitution, Declaration of Independence. We're also known for our stubborn independence. And in fact, we were the last state to sign on to, uh, to become a part of the United States. But um, I wanted to just touch base on five uh, pillars of Roger Williams and his belief. And I think it plays into what we're talking about today. Number one, Roger Williams believed in the freedom of conscience. Um, he was banished by the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, and he came to Rhode Island. He found Rhode Island. And he brought together a community that, had a, that was a model of respect for other beliefs accepting those he did not agree with, both religiously and politically, as long as they were good citizens and worked for the common good. So that was his first uh, pillar. The second one is learning from others. He tried to learn from the groups that were, the group that was here initially was the Narragansett Indians. And we have Narragansett Bay here in Rhode Island. But he tried to learn from the indigenous people that were already here. And he wanted to know more about them, and be sensitive to their traditions and their beliefs. And he also learned five languages. And I know talk about Sanskrit earlier. Um, he learned French, Dutch, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Number three, he learned from the land. He learned about fishing and farming from the Narragansett Indians and tried to be sensitive to the ecology of the land from these natives that were already here. Number four, Roger Williams, he used his imagination. He created a new community here in Rhode Island, something that had never been done before. He got thrown out of Massachusetts. He was trying to get the approval of the King of England, but he founded a colony here to be something different. And it was based on a new idea. And it was something that was resisted by, again, Massachusetts, but also uh, trying to get the approval of England. Uh, fifth and finally, he believed in the common good. He knew it was not enough to create a colony of free thinking individuals. For Rhode Islanders to survive, he knew that they needed to work together for the common good. And you know, these are the basis of a lot of what America is founded on. And Roger Williams really was instrumental in doing that. You know, I heard uh, what you talked about earlier about a Hindu and what's happening. And my wife and I are so involved in the community that we feel like we're a part of it. And you know, uh, the other Vivek who was just on talking about, you know, the need for so many things we need to do. Well, you know, one of the things we need to do is to have advocates for the Hindu people, the Indian people and their faith. And here in this country, we would like to think that things are going to just naturally uh, come a certain way, but it's going to take a lot of hard work. And, you know, um, it's going to take people who are willing to step up and run for office who are willing to advocate for Hinduism and the India people. And that is one of the reasons and one of the hallmarks of my campaign. And you see behind me a sign, Lansing for Congress, 
and you notice the India flag and the American flag, because I've made that part of my campaign that I would advocate for Hindu and the India people, Hinduism and the India people. Um, and you mentioned Sanjay Call earlier, a dear friend. And I was up in Massachusetts, a presentation he did. And he talked about the seven diasporas in Kashmir and Jammu. But of the seven, the worst was the last one, I think in 1990. And recently a movie came out, didn't it? Which you're aware of, I think, the Kashmir Files, the Kashmir Files that tell about that last uh, diaspora. And you know what? That is something that needs to be seen by everybody, regardless of your background, faith, or religion. But that is something we need to have people see because it's a powerful story about what happens when we lose tolerance and the ability to uh, be sensitive to others' cultures and religions. And that has been a hallmark of Rhode Island, of Roger Williams, and this state as a whole. And it's something, again, that was involved in what it meant to be an American, tolerance and understanding. You know, I'm a former Navy chaplain. I am a disabled vet. And you know, as a Navy chaplain, I had three charges that I really, when I was brought into the military, the first charge was to brought in to be, care for my own, which would be fellow American Baptists. I'm a fellow, I'm an American Baptist ordained minister. But the second was to facilitate for other faith groups, whether it was Catholic or Jewish or Hindu or Buddhist or whatever, to facilitate for those groups. But the third and final charge, probably the most important of all, was to care for all, irregardless of their faith or lack of faith. And those three charges is what I live by even today. And if we had more of that, again, caring for our own, facilitating for others, but caring for all, it, that would make the difference, I think, in this world of ours. And, you know, there is a battle going on, and uh, Vivek talked about it. And unfortunately, whether we like it or not, some of those battles, as you know, are being fought in the halls of Congress, both our House of Representatives and our Senate. And you highlighted some of them earlier, those battles and meeting with people. India and uh, its people here in America, I always say the India people are models of what we would want people to be who come to this country. People of faith, people who volunteer, family oriented. Those are the values I think that are values, American values. And those are values that you actually uh, really live and exemplify. And my wife and I, we spend so much time with you uh, and people around here, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, even New York. I've been personal friends with the Council General of New York, the Indian ambassador, and as well as got to know a little bit, the Indian ambassador of the UN. And I feel that that's a privilege on my part. And we continue to be invited and we go to a number of things. In fact, I'm doing this today and I'll be a chief guest at two more events in the next two Sundays. Um, but uh, I, I so appreciate everything that's being said here today, and it is so important. And I like what you're trying to do as far as educating. I think that is probably the most important thing we can do. And we talk about the Armenian genocide and the Holocaust. We need to talk about the India people and what they suffered um, in the movie based on the Kashmir files in uh, Kashmir and, and Jammu. And uh, so uh, I'm one of those people that wanna be an advocate. And I've told people, in fact, it was an event yesterday, up in Massachusetts, and I said, when elected, I will be India's best friend in Congress, and I will advocate for the Indian people and the Hindu faith, because it's important, because it is under attack, but so is Christianity. It is anti-Semitism that's rising again, and you're right, political correctness has a lot to do with that. We've got to fight that, push back against it, and we can change this nation and become what we should have been, in my case, going all the way back to Roger Williams creating a different society, one that is tolerant of all different viewpoints, as long as we're all working for the common good. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. And clearly the United States will be honored to have such an incredible um, person with values such as yours, um, Mr. Lance here, representing them in Congress. So we look forward to that. And thank you for your um, very powerful support for the Indian American Hindu diaspora. And you certainly are a friend and an ally and uh, it's individuals like you who really move, help move the ball forward and um, 
give inspiration and hope to everyone who is looking forward to seeing things occur. So thank you. I hope everyone here is enjoying the presentation so far. It's been wonderful. Uh, in our chat, you'll see a link to donate to Hindu Pack directly to the website. And we thank you for all of your support. Now, I am honored to introduce Deepti Mahajanji. She is the Principal Solutions Architect and Business Architect for Cloud Applications at the Department of Economic Security with the US government and is an extremely talented graphic artist and designer in addition to that. She is passionate about world politics and seeing her Janam Bhumi, Bharat and Karm Bhumi, USA, thrive, prosper, and follow equal humanitarian principles. Her role at Hindu Pact is chapter coordinator for Northern California, where she also works passionately on the Chingari project of Hindu Pact. Cali girl here, so I appreciate that. For Deep DG, being Hindu means to dedicatedly follow her karma, her duties, and being on a constant path of gaining knowledge and showing devotion towards humanity by always doing good to others. Deep DG, we welcome your presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Del. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Namaste, everyone. Hindu Pact has uh, come a long way. And in just last two years, uh, we have done a lot, but we also have a long way to go. Now, next, we present our plans for our upcoming 22, uh, 2022 to 23 projects. Uh, but before that, I would also like to take a minute to say that as a parent of a teenager and a small kid, I'm extremely concerned about our children and our future generations. What mindset will they develop with the current anti-Hindu propaganda? So these efforts that Hindu Pact is taking that we'll be discussing uh, now, uh, they require a lot of resources. So therefore I will really encourage everyone and thank you for all the contributions so far, but we really like to have more support and uh, contributions towards uh, Hindu Pact. Uh, listed here are some of our high level initiatives that we plan for this upcoming year. Some of them are an extension of what we have already started, and then some are new. So let's take a look at them one by one. So first is going to be our efforts towards political advocacy and, uh, and policy research. So uh, upcoming 2022 midterms, we are most likely to see a major shift of power uh, with expected majority of Republicans, both in the House and the Senate. We plan an outreach to both sitting congressmen, women, and new challengers that have a good chance of winning. So how we will pick our primary candidate to support is first, we will be doing a lot of research on social media of all all the candidates that are up for re-election. And we will be using resources like justfacts.org, ballotpedia, vote.org, iwaterguide.com. And if we find any unfriendly content with the candidates, we will approach their opponents to see if they are more friendlier towards our issues. So we will be sending, uh, secondly, uh, a questionnaire that covers critical American policy issues concerning um, uh, our Indian subcontinent to all the winners of primaries from both parties in races around the country. And based on the responses that we get from the questionnaire and the chances of the candidates' victory, we will be supporting uh, those, uh, we'll be providing support to those uh, candidates. Now, candidates fully in line and willing to make statements and taking uh, those uh, our talking points towards in, uh, towards India during their ca uh, campaigns and also mirroring our goals will be provided additional support by Hindu Bank. Uh, the states that we will be fully uh, covering are going to be Virginia, Florida, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Michigan. And other states like Texas, Washington, New York, etc., will be covered selectively based on uh, the strength of Indian Americans and also Hindu American populations in those areas. 
And lastly, the primary candidates who are challenging anti-India lawmakers across the country can be supported by us. So they will be picked on a very case-by-case -case basis uh, and their campaigns will be supported. So for example, Congressman Andy Levin, who recently appeared in uh, anti-Hindu briefing on Kashmir, we are trying to vet his opponent, Representative Haley Stevens, to see if she is relatively less anti-Hindu. And then a contribution can be made to her campaign, just as an example. Now, uh, in our Chingari that um, uh, Adele just mentioned, in our Chingari project in our phase two, beginning May of 2022, we are targeting US companies that invest in Pakistan, or they are sourcing their products from there. Given the buildup and investment uh, being done in Pakistan by the sports manufacturing industry, it is very important to make an effort to stifle Pakistan's economy as a bargaining tool for a more tangible outcome for the safety and viability of the religious minorities there. Some of these companies that we have identified are American Eagle, Abercrombie & Fitch, Nike, Sears, Walmart, Gap, Old Navy. Uh, so the steps for our outreaches that we will demand, A, the companies give a written assurance that they do not do business with or procure raw materials or products from vendors and individuals that are connected to any groups and organizations involved in forced conversion and human trafficking. And B, the company uh, performs and employee audit in Pakistan and ensures that none of their employees and vendors employ perpetrators of forced conversion. So the uh, outcomes that we are expecting is one, that it's gonna create a constant buzz in the media space for the need to boycott companies that do business in Pakistan. And two, get companies to make public comments and statements uh, and also present policy clarifications to justify their position and uh, uh, opening themselves up for further activism and possible uh, uh, actual economic outcomes. Um, Bhagwan uh, Shri Krishna asked Arjun to stand up for his rights and fight for a righteous cause that is his dharma. Hindus advancing human rights internationally, Hari, takes inspiration from Bhagavad Gita and advocates for human rights across the world. So we plan awareness campaigns on Hindus facing human rights abuse around the world under the banner of Hindus advancing human rights internationally. And lastly, we will publish uh, our position papers on geopolitical issues that affect Hindus globally. Uh, education, uh, social, cultural aspects, all of those that impact Hindus across America, we will uh, publish our papers on that too. Now, for our legislative actions, we have caste resolution, Hindu voter engagement, and bills. Starting uh, April 22, we will have an year-long engagement in changing the narrative that we have see been seeing so far um, that is focused on the ones who are making caste an issue in America and Canada. We plan on a signature campaign on Islamophobia resolution in the Senate. We've already spoken to four senators and we are also speaking to more senators as the Senate bill lies dormant in the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee. Additionally, we are working towards getting bills, resolutions regarding 1971 Bangladesh genocide. We will continue the outreach to get 1971 genocide of almost 3 million Hindus to be recognized. Uh, we are also working towards creating awareness of uh, safeguarding the artifacts in Afghanistan and not losing them like we uh, lost Bamiyan Buddhas and also campaigning against the Islamophobia bill. Uh, as part of our awareness, um, we have a couple of things that we will, we will be focusing on. One is Hindutva, so creating awareness through infographics and countering the propaganda on the issues uh, using media and outreach. Uh, swastika versus Hakim Krush issue will also, we'll see that it um, will continue to emerge in legislative conversations across US and Canada, 
Hindu Pact hopes to educate lawmakers and mobilize temples to create awareness. We will encourage everyone on this call in our audience today that they keep tuning in into our weekly Hindu lounge that we cover a lot of burning topics uh, every week. Um, American Hindus Against Defamation was convened by Dr. Rajesh Shah, the president of BHPA. Um, Hindu Dvesha is systematized and institutionalized in school textbooks, not only in the US, but also around the world, including India. Um, it deeply impacts our younger generation who are taught that Hinduism is backward, hierarchical, and guilty of oppression from time immemorial. Our Hindu Dvesha project will continue to create intellectual property that methodologically counters the disinformation produced against our communities. We plan to use more content from the work being produced by the team at Explore and Expose Hindu Dvesha. As part of our uh, American Hindus Against Defamation actions, we are on an ever vigilant group um, to overcome hate, preserve the sanctity of Hindu symbols, icons, culture, and customs. Um, as part of our outbound marketing, we will continue to produce infographics, uh, one infographic a month that provides uh, critical information to viewers. Our weekly newsletters will continue to go out updating people of plans and activities. Our website will continue to get updated every week. And please go ahead and sign up for our Twitter, Facebook, TikTok accounts uh, at Hindu Pact. Um, we enthusiastically coordinate with Hindu Mandir Executive Conference, all Hindutva organizations, interfaith committees, and Armenian, Jewish, Muslim, and Christian organizations. And we plan on keeping that coordination going. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Deep TG, for that really informative presentation and we thank everyone here again for your for your support and for being here and i would like to now introduce again and invite rather anjali swami ji to sing a rendition of k sera sera When I was just a little girl, I asked my mother, what will I be? Will I be pretty? Will I be rich? Here's what she said to me. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera. Sweetheart, what lies ahead? Will we have rainbows day after day? Here's what my sweetheart said. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera. What will be, will be. Now I have children of my own They ask their mother, what will I be? Will I be handsome? Will I be rich? I tell them tenderly Que sera, sera Whatever will be, will be The future's not ours to see Que sera Sera. What will be, will be. He said, I said, I. Thank you, Anjali Swamiji, for that beautiful rendition of K. Sera Sera. 
I definitely know who I'm bringing to karaoke next time. With that, I would now like to turn your attention to Zainab Zeb Khan. She is a chairperson and a founding member of the Muslim American Leadership Alliance, MALA, and an advisory board member for PBS's Exploring Hate. Zainab helped launch the first ever collection of oral histories from Muslim Americans archived into the National Library of Congress titled Muslim American Journeys. Zainab is also the first Muslim woman to hold the title of Mrs. New York on behalf of international pageants, and she is the current crown holder. Welcome Zainab Zeb Khan to our gala event. Hello, my name is Zainab Zeb Khan and I am one of the founders and president of the Muslim American Leadership Alliance. It's truly an honor to join your organization um, and this wonderful event. Uh, this is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, as a background, I am of Indo-Pakistani and Afghan descent. My mother was from, um, her family originated from the north part of uh, India. And my father was from Kabul, Afghanistan. So I kind of see myself as this um, hybrid of wonderful cultures and being born in the United States, being a proud American, and also celebrating my Muslim heritage. With MALA, we are the first organization to archive, collect, and spotlight stories from Americans of Muslim heritage. And this ranges from first to fourth generations, converts, people of mixed heritage, and we are actually the first organization and only organization to archive these stories into the National Library of Congress. So they are preserved for generations to come. Um, storytelling has been always at the core of what MALA does. And the reason why I stress that this is so important is that personal stories are the catalyst for change. These are personal testimonies of people and their experiences. With MALA, we are a non-political and non-theological organization. And yes, I admit that can be very challenging in today's world, especially with the word Muslim in our organization. However, I really want to stress that so much of our community comes from mixed heritages and different backgrounds. I myself come from an interfaith family. My older sister is married to a Catholic. My younger sister is married to a Hindu. And it's just this beautiful montage of where we're able to celebrate Holy, Christmas, Eid, and all these other wonderful cultural and religious observances. From our storytellers, I can really say that we have been able to spotlight narratives of people that have faced extremism, that have challenged extremism, that have stood up to extremism. And this is something that is very profound and powerful, especially coming from a Muslim organization. When we talk about stories, we are talking about people that identify from all different uh, backgrounds as Muslim, ranging from Africa to Eastern Europe, to Asia, to East Asia, even to Latin America. And the purpose of these stories is really to share shared heritage and also to show um, shared values in interfaith communities, especially now where every kind of um, stance or nuance is taken and turned into something polarizing rather than uniting. I think it's very important for us as organizational leaders and community leaders to come together and really, really emphasize the need for social cohesion through interfaith bridge building and programs. The video that we are going to share with you is actually a, just a small montage collection of our oral histories that are archived into the National Library of Congress. You can also take a look at the stories, read them, listen to them on Spotify or our website, which is www.malanational.org. Here's a video montage of our stories and our collection of oral histories. Really hope that you are able to identify and resonate with some of the narratives that are shared in this video. I think storytelling is important because we always have something that we can learn from the next person. 
every single one of us is going through something. And so it's always important to be able to share stories because you really might change the next person's idea um, or, or you know the next person's perspective. That's what storytelling does. Like the fact that you may not know me very well, um, but you're able to sit there and listen to my narrative and lean in and give me the empathetic eyes because I'm just a human who is opening up. Like that's helpful, right? Because I, I, I feel seen in those eyes. And I think that when, we, when we're able to do that for each other, it doesn't make everything go away, but it reminds us that we matter. And if we can get enough of those repetitions, then hopefully it can override the ones when we felt like we didn't. I think that the reason why we have storytelling is for character building and for um, stories that inspire that. Because sometimes we don't know that we're able to do something until we see someone else do it and we're inspired in that way. That's what I see. I see, I see people being vulnerable about their, their situations and wanting to share that with uh, others. And I see people being receptive to the messages that are being conveyed. It's, it feels really good for me to be able to tell my own story and just see people laughing or like nodding their head at least, at the very least, or just seeing them just like captured by my story. It makes me really happy because I'm like, they're getting it. They're understanding me, they're learning. And I'm, I mean, I hope we're connecting because that's the whole point of storytelling and stand up for me is I just want everyone to feel closer together and more connected. Like we're all the same, you know? My name is Salma. My name is Taha Muhammad Ali. I am Naza Kawaja. I am Sabine Sadiq. My name is Alinda Hassan. My name is Bak Tashahadi. My name is Amir Neely. My name is Ali Imran. My name is Zainab Khan. My name is Ilmamoun Yusuf Sulfab. Rowan O'Day. Sara Ahmed. Ashil Faraman. I'm Sharif Zafar. My name is Asifa Hanif. I'm a hip hop artist. I am an educator. I am an individual. I'm a stand-up comedian, writer, and actor. I work as a policy manager at Spotify. I'm a refugee, immigrant, and American. And I'm a long-time journalist. I'm one of the co-founders of MALA, the Muslim American Leadership Alliance. I work for Facebook in Washington, D.C. And this is my story. 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 Again, I hope that these snippets of stories have inspired you, are just a reflection, a very small reflection of what our community has experienced. When it comes to storytelling, we obviously cannot forget the past, the present, and what may be the near future. We will be rolling out a campaign titled Voices of Resilience, which will feature really profound firsthand narratives of Afghans who are now resettled in America, who fled the Taliban rule back last August. The reason this is so important and the reason why I share this with you today is because many of these Afghan brave, courageous voices that shared their stories with us and that will be detailing their harrowing accounts of their escape had actually found refuge in India. And this is very important because I think it's quite often overlooked at Muslim, Jewish and Muslim Hindu relations is how much we have been able to have support from interfaith communities, especially when it comes to people and civilians that are fleeing extremism and terrorism in their respective home countries. This is where interfaith, the power of interfaith and the power of humanity and bridge building really takes place and really warms my heart when I see these stories and I see the impact that other interfaith community members have had. Um, and I, I feel that that is so, uh, I feel that that is something that's quite underreported when it comes to positive news and when it comes to actual work that's being done. True bridge building is about acceptance, it's about tolerance, and it's also about understanding and working across and amongst each other. America, a country that has benefited from immigration, embraces diversity and goes back to valuing the qualities that made this country so great. Qualities like hard work and merit, 
and not to judge people's capabilities based on the color of their skin or the faith that they identify with. Mala has broken stereotypes about Muslims in America, and today's event is a show of how promoting religious freedom and diversity of culture is a recipe for success and the fulfillment of striving for the American dream. Mala also continues to highlight the fact that there are Muslim Americans who care about gender equality, who care about freedom of expression, who care about the much needed quality of mutual respect, and of course, the bedrock of all democracy, freedom of speech. This is something that I take a lot of pride in for Mala, and we have been able to spotlight some incredible narratives from people in our communities from all different backgrounds who identify as Muslim Americans. So much for putting on this evening's event. I wish this event wonderful success. Thank you so much for including my voice, for including Mala, for including the Muslim American perspective and the Muslim American journeys, as we may say. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Zainab, for that uh, beautiful and powerful speech. Uh, and thanks so much for sharing about Mala with us. Um, we are also thankful for all the pledges that are coming in. And I would again encourage our audience to generously contribute to Hindu Pact to support all our endeavors towards Hindu causes, because these endeavors require time and resources, uh, working to make Hinduism thrive and also fight the anti-Hindu propaganda. Our donors uh, donating today more than uh, 500 uh, will also get merchandise with Hindu Pact logo and messaging. Now let's welcome a beautiful song by Anjali Swamiji. छोड़ो कल की बातें कल की बात पुरानी नए दौर में लिखेंगे मिलकर नई कहानी हम हिंदुस्तानी हम हिंदुस्तानी हम हिंदुस्तानी हम हिंदुस्तानी आज पुरानी जंजीरों को तोड़ चुके हैं क्या देखे उस मंजिल को जो छोड़ चुके हैं चांद के तर पर जा पहुंचा है आज जमाना नए जगत से हम भी नाता जोड़ चुके हैं नया खून है नई उमंगे अब है नई जवानी हम हिंदुस्तानी छोड़ो कल की बातें कल की बात पुरानी नए दौर में लिखेंगे मिलकर नई कहानी हम हिंदुस्तानी हम हिंदुस्तानी आओ मेहनत को अपना ही मान बनाए अपने हाथों को अपना भगवान बनाए राम की इस धरती को गौतम की भूमि को सपनों से भी प्यारा हिंदुस्तान बनाए नया खून है नई उमंगे अब है नई जवानी हम हिंदुस्तानी हम हिंदुस्तानी हम हिंदुस्तानी हर जरा है मोती हाथ उठा कर देखो मिट्टी में सोना है 
यहाँ पढ़ा कर देखो सोने की ये गंगा चांदी की ये यमुना चाहो तो पत्थर से धान उगा कर देखो नया खून है नई उमंगे अब है नई जवानी हम हिंदुस्तानी हम हिंदुस्तानी हम हिंदुस्तानी नमस्कार व्हाट अ वंडरफुल सॉन्ग अंजलि लुक्स लाइक यू एनर्जाइज अस एंड अडेल थैंक यू सो मच फॉर यू बीइंग वंडरफुल एमसी आई एम श्योर यू ऑल आर एंजॉयिंग द प्रोग्राम आई जस्ट वांट टू मेक अ स्पेशल अपील टू ऑल द पेरेंट्स एंड ग्रैंड पेरेंट्स हु आर इन द ऑडियंस राइट नाउ एंड व्हाट आई वांट यू टू आस्क इज व्हाट काइंड ऑफ लेगेसी heritage in inheritance we are going to leave for our children and grandchildren what happens if in the future our children do not remain hindu or they are ashamed to call themselves hindu or the our great hindu dharma loses its respect and a firm ground in america what will happen to that think about it so therefore we need hindu pact we need you to support hindu pact to establish a advocacy hindu identity in this great country and more so over i would say consider this as an investment for the future of your children i'm sure you are going to look into that and as far as we are concerned we are working on our donations and even though uh, ajay shah ji put our goal very high but i think we already have crossed 50000 plus in pledges so far and i'm sure that donations will continue coming up I have one very special guest today, Neeraj Antani, our state senator, who is very near and dear to me. Neeraj, please join us and share few words, a message for Hindu Pact. Uh, can you spotlight Neeraj, please, Neeraj Antani? I told, I think. Uh, it's it's okay if he, uh, i mean he's she's here there is unmute yourself to start speaking how about that and you will come uh okay so why don't we do one thing let me let me get adel back and and utsav and we will invite neeraj again hi this is great it's just technical thing um reenu ji thank you so so much for your your efforts everything that you do we are so grateful to have you as part of this team and leading all the efforts you're incredible and i also want to take this moment to say anyone who wants to join hindu pact as a volunteer part of our core team please again put your effort your information into the chat now i would like to introduce the executive director of hindu pact utsav chakravarti and i would like to answer some questions from our audience um it's of g i believe you're on the screen now thank you adel oh, and uh, thank you for inviting me thank you for doing a wonderful job today and as always a wonderful job every day with hindu pact uh please uh please go ahead with the question so the first question is going to come from uh shrinivas Utsav ji, what has been the most challenging issue for Hindu Pact in the last year? That's a very good question. Thank you, Shrinivas. Uh, I think the biggest challenge that we have faced over the last year uh, is that there has been a concerted, organized, and a well-planned effort to target Hindu communities across the U.S. in terms of disinformation and in terms of uh, minimizing. the role of the hindu community in america and as hindu pact we have had to deal with it on a everyday basis literally and one of our efforts has been to counter it in the information sphere space as well as in the political outreach and the social outreach space uh, so that would be uh, in my opinion the biggest challenge that we have faced and it is it is concerted organized and and very well planned that is the biggest worry that we have and i think going forward we have to deal with it in a similar manner in a well planned concerted and organized manner 
uh, that in my in my opinion is the is the biggest uh, challenge we face and once again adel thank you to everybody in hindu pact for uh, for doing everything that they're doing the, behind this this event that you saw today there are so many volunteers dozens of volunteers that we have and as you see today adel in front of the screen uh, she has been working with us uh, you know tirelessly for the last one year so uh, if there are any other questions uh, uh, i'm here to answer them and uh, uh, if if there are any other questions from the audience and uh, if not then uh, if neeraj is available i would like to spotlight on neeraj again and have him say a few words neeraj are, uh, are you available yes can you hear me okay utsav yes thank you so much uh, please please say a few words and uh, this is so unplanned and unscripted so please thank you so much for joining us today and say a few words please yes thank you uh, utsav and ranuanti sorry i think we had some technical uh, difficulties but i'm able to get my audio working i just want to thank uh, hindu pact for uh, and vhpa for all of the work uh, you are doing uh, you know as the uh, one of the only uh, real hindu uh, uh, state senators and, and elected officials uh, in the country and the youngest uh, Hindu elected official in the country, you know, I, I know that what you all are doing uh, is incredibly, incredibly important. We are uh, under attack uh, all of the time from uh, the radical uh, Islamists uh, in this country, from CARE uh, and many of those organizations who, you know, want to push the United States to take uh, anti-India and anti-Hindu uh, positions, but we know uh, that we as, as the diaspora and the Hindus uh, in this country uh, need to support uh, India uh, when it comes to the abrogation of 370, when it comes to uh, CAA, uh, and when it comes to other pro-India uh, and pro-Hindu policies. And so, you know, the work that Hindu Pact is doing, uh, you know, particularly with members of Congress uh, is incredibly important. Uh, and just very happy to be able to join and and give some, my support to Hindu Pact. Thank you so much, Neeraj. And uh, once again, thank you everybody for joining tonight. Thank you to every member, every volunteer of Hindu Pact who spend hours and hours every day uh, working hard to make sure that we move forward and that as Hindus in America, we have a future and a very bright future as such. And thank you once again, Adele, for hosting a wonderful event. I just want to make sure that everybody knows Hindu Pact is a 501c3 organization. We are not uh, political. Uh, we don't support any particular political party. Uh, we educate people. And that's why it's important that you all know we are a 501c3 organization. And once again, I request everybody to support us. What you give us will mean a lot to us because what we are doing is endless work. Thank you so much and have a nice evening.